Mrs. Kennedy jumped up and grabbed Mr. Kennedy. She called, oh no, the motorcade sped on. Good evening, Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. John Lennon, outside of his apartment building on the west side of New York City, shot twice in the back, rushed to Roosevelt Hospital, dead on arrival. Good morning. A masked gunman is reported to have opened fire at a premiere of the new Batman film in the United States. A hospital in Denver says around 20 people were injured. 29 on your Friday morning. We're going to interrupt programming. We've been telling you this morning there has been a shooting at a school in Newtown. This is the Sandy Hook Elementary School. First tonight at five, major breaking news. Right now, two people dead after two explosions at the finish line of the famed Boston Marathon. President Kennedy shot today just as his motorcade left downtown Dallas. Like the FBI and the CIA and the BBC. Like the, like the FBI and the CIA. Supersonic decelerating counter rotating turbines third degree. Oh, depress the aerothermal and thermal research jets. Accelerate the isothermal oxyacetylene cell vaporometers. Invert the compression radial ratio. Energize the tandem ailerons third degree while I turn up this interplanetary microphone. <laughs> I, 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 Dr. James A. Spencer, can you read me? Can you read me? Come in. Come in. I can read you loud and clear. All right, stand by. I'm going to beam you up right now. Lower the count of the silence. Yes, sir. We're going to continue with the 50 Reasons for 50 Years Review. This week's episode, Richard Case Nagel. Jim Garrison described him as the most important witness in the JFK assassination. But you won't find his name anywhere in the Warren Commission report. Author Dick Russell has conducted exhaustive research on Richard Nagel. My name is Dick Russell, and I'm the author of a book called The Man Who Knew Too Much. It's a lengthy investigation of the Kennedy assassination and what I believe was a conspiracy in that tragedy that took place on November 22, 1963. The main focus of the book is a guy named Richard Case Nagel, whom I knew and interviewed on a number of occasions between 1975 and his death in 1996. Nigel was well known to the intelligence community. He was, in fact, an agent of the CIA and also a double agent for the Soviet, either KGB or GRU. Nagel had been the youngest soldier promoted to captain during the Korean War and gone on to a career in military intelligence. He had first met Lee Harvey Oswald in Japan in the late 1950s when he was stationed there and later was assigned by the intelligence agencies to monitor Oswald's activities after Oswald came back from Russia in uh, 1962. What transpired next was Nagel's involvement with Oswald in a small conspiracy that he was monitoring to assassinate President Kennedy. According to Nagel, uh, Oswald was involved in this conspiracy as an intelligence guy, but whether he was really a loyal to the, uh, to, to the Cubans or not is questionable. This is not to say the Cubans did it. The conspiracy that Nagel was involved in involved elements of the American intelligence community and anti-Castro Cuban exiles who were posing to Oswald as pro-Castro agents and had supposedly convinced him that if he took part in this assassination, he would be welcomed in Cuba as a revolutionary hero because Castro was retaliating for the CIA's plots against him. Now, what happened eventually was that Nagel took himself out of the picture. He was ordered to either convince Oswald that he was being set up, that this was a phony deal, or to kill him in Mexico City toward the end of September 1963. Instead, Nagel walked into a bank in El Paso, Texas, on the 20th of September, uh, shot two holes in the ceiling of the bank and intentionally got himself arrested and taken out of the picture. Now this story may sound fantastic, but there's evidence to back it up. And of all the people that I interviewed about the assassination, and there were many, including many who claimed to have had involvement, Nagel was, I believe, one of the few that was totally legitimate. 
when he was arrested by the uh, FBI, and he made sure it was the FBI, in the, the bank in Texas two months before the assassination, Nagel had on him two notebooks, in fact. And one of them had the address and the phone number in Mexico City of the Cuban embassy that Oswald had been in touch with, and also listings for the Fair Play for Cuba committee that Oswald was part of. Nagel also had, and this was really astounding, he had in his possession a military ID card that belonged to Oswald. And in fact, it was called a Uniform Services Identification Card, and the Dallas police had seized this from him after the assassination. The card that the police took from Oswald had a Department of Defense overstamp on it. The card in Nagel's possession, with the same number, had a different photograph, a different signature, and no Department of Defense overstamp. Now, in those days, you couldn't just fabricate these things on a computer. There was no computer to do that. And so somehow, Nagel was involved with Oswald in this intelligence operation that, that involved him having different uniform services identification cards. This was enough to convince me, the notebook and the ID card, that uh, Nagel was for real. What happened eventually to Nagel was he was railroaded through prison for four and a half years for that alleged bank robbery. When he came out, he was arrested on a train in East Germany and apparently taken to Moscow where he was debriefed by the Russians over what had happened. Eventually, he died mysteriously in 1996, this very day that the Assassinations Record Review Board had sent a subpoena to him to find out what he, what he could tell them about what had happened. That day, he was found dead in his home of an apparent heart attack. He is one of the leading witnesses, and many of them have disappeared and died over the years, and I think a very important link to understanding what really happened to President Kennedy on that terrible day. And I've chronicled all this in my book, The Man Who Knew Too Much. All right, Dr. Fesser, the case of Richard Case Nagel. Well, it's fascinating stuff. I think, interestingly, in this case, uh, Dick Russell knows too much because it seems to me that in this brief episode, which is very good as far as it goes, he doesn't emphasize the key point, namely that Nagel had the prior knowledge that JFK was going to be assassinated and that the reason he went into the bank and fired two shots into the ceiling was to get himself arrested so he'd have a cast iron or steel bar alibi for not having been involved in the, in the, in the death of JFK. So I think it would have been better had Lamb re-edited this to make the key point that Dick Russell elaborates in such enormous detail in his book The Man Who Knew Too Much more obvious and conspicuous to the audience viewing this specific episode. November 1963, three weeks before Dallas, working on a tip from an FBI informant named Lee, a plot to assassinate President John F. Kennedy in Chicago is revealed. But the Secret Service don't inform anyone in Dallas. Filmmaker Ted Yacucci is working on a full-length documentary on the Chicago plot. Here is a preview from his upcoming film. There were actually two tips that reached the Secret Service in the week before JFK's trip here to Chicago. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover reported the first tip to Chicago Secret Service agent in charge, Maurice Martineau. Hoover's information was that at least one hit team with high-powered rifles would attempt to shoot the president from a warehouse or office building overlooking the president's motorcade route that coming Saturday. A break in the case came on Thursday, October 30th, two days before the president's arrival at O'Hare. A landlady at a rooming house here in the vicinity of Clark and Division Streets reported that she oversaw four rifles with scopes and a map of the president's motorcade route in one of the rooms she had rented to four dark-complected men. Chicago Secret Service initiated 24-hour surveillance, but Agent J. Lloyd Stocks blew his cover in an alleyway behind the rooming house on Friday evening and had to take two of the suspects into immediate custody. The second tip involved a man reportedly spouting anti-Kennedy rhetoric and known to have owned multiple firearms. There were some amazing similarities between this man and the man who would be arrested for JFK's murder three weeks later. 
Thomas Vallee had been given a job at the IPP Lithoplate Company, a printer, on the third floor. 625 West Jackson Street was a warehouse in 1963. Kennedy's limousine was scheduled to make a slow turn from the Northwest Expressway onto the Jackson Street exit and go right by Vallee's third floor window. So in August 1963, just as Lee Oswald was preparing to move from New Orleans back to Dallas, Thomas Vallee moved from New York City back to Chicago. Just as Oswald got a job right over Kennedy's future motorcade route in Dallas, so too did Vallee get a job in a warehouse right over Kennedy's future motorcade route in Chicago. That Saturday morning, November 2, 1963, crowds had started to line the streets in preparation for President Kennedy's visit. The press plane had taken off from Washington, but at least two shooters remained at large, and Kennedy's advisors convinced him to cancel his trip. And finally, the arrest of Thomas Arthur Vallee is made. Vallee's arrest was made by two CIA-connected Chicago police officers, Officers Daniel Groth and Peter Sherla had watched Vallee all night, but only arrested him at 9.10 a.m., two and a half hours before the president was due in Chicago and after the trip was officially canceled. For the success of the assassination plot, the scapegoat had to remain free so long as Kennedy was still coming to Chicago and could be killed there. On the following Monday and Tuesday, special agent in charge Maurice Martineau collected the Chicago plot information from his Secret Service agents. Unlike their work in other investigations, they were told to prepare no documents of their own. In the Chicago office, only Martineau wrote and saw the top secret report. He then sent it by special courier to Washington Chief James Rowley. Incredibly, Secret Service agents in Dallas and the Dallas police will never be told about the activities in Chicago. They will not be told that a four-man hit team was sent to Chicago less than three weeks before with the intent of shooting the president with high-powered rifles from unguarded office buildings overlooking his motorcade route. When Chicago Secret Service agent Abraham Bolden tried to contact the Warren Commission several months later with information about the Chicago plot, he was arrested on false charges. Bolden was placed in jail, keeping him away from telling what he knew about the Chicago plot to the public and the Warren Commission. Not one word of the Chicago plot appears in the Warren Commission report. The Chicago plot. Well, I think this is a very telling uh, episode that implicates the Secret Service in concealing the fact that the president was being the target of an assassination attempt. Abraham Bolden was the first black Secret Service agent whom JFK first encountered actually in a men's room and uh, promoted to the Secret Service. Uh, his book, The Echo from Dealey Plaza, is a very important in revealing that an informant by the name of Lee had tipped them off that this uh, plot was in the works and he reasonably infers and I agree that that was almost certainly Lee Oswald who was uh, working as an informant for the FBI at the time I've interviewed Abraham Bolden and those who would like to hear the interview can go to the archives for my radio show The Real Deal at radiofetzer.blogspot.com but in my opinion this all this episode is very damning and, and implicates the secret service and the plot to to assassinate jfk tonight our look at the war and omission continues with the story of rose sheremy abandoned on a louisiana highway days before the assassination she spoke to numerous witnesses including a policeman about a plot to assassinate the president in dallas Author Jim DiEugenio describes this clear example of foreknowledge in the murder that the Warren Commission should have known about. This is Jim DiEugenio. On the evening of November the 20th, 1963, a woman named Rose Sheremy, who had a drug addiction problem and was linked to Jack Ruby's Carousel Club, was found on the Louisiana Highway 
north of New Orleans. She was taken into custody and put in an emergency ward at a public hospital. Lieutenant Francis Truget, who handled these kinds of cases, was at a policeman's ball that night. He was called by the supervisor of the hospital and told to come over, you know, and see what he could do with the woman. He did. He talked to her, found out what her name was, and they decided to move her to a hospital which was more of a public institution and did not charge for emergency actions. So as they got her into a car, in this car ride, she began to say the most extraordinary things about how President Kennedy was going to be assassinated a few days later in Dallas. And Fruget didn't think anything of it because he just thought it was the ratings of a drug addled woman who needed a fix. So he just went ahead and kept on driving up there, dropped her off to the hospital. The day of the Kennedy assassination, he calls the hospital and says, don't give that woman to anybody else until I interview her. He found out, of course, that she knew what she was talking about. So he went back to the hospital, picked her up, and she started telling him this story about how she knew this information, that she had been driving in a car with two men and they had been talking about killing Kennedy. She had also been involved in a drug deal. She went ahead and described all the aspects of this drug deal, where the transaction was going to take place, where the drugs were coming in at, on what ship they were coming in at, etc. Then she said that she had known that Ruby and Oswald had to know each other because she saw Oswald together with Ruby at one of his saloons because she had worked there for a short time. So with all this information, Fruget then decided that he should call the Dallas authorities to see if they wanted to talk to the woman. So he and his supervisor talked to Wilfretz and they said no, that they weren't interested in this other information, they had solved the case. What happened of course is that Fruget began to check out for information. Everything about the drug deal checked out. When Jim Garrison went ahead and reopened the case in 1967, he decided to give him pictures of particular suspects, and he went back to the bar that Jeremy was in before the two gentlemen threw her out, and the barkeeper, Mac Manuel, ID'd two of the photographs as being Sergio Arcachi Smith and Emilio Santana. These, of course, are two men who surfaced very strongly in the Jim Garrison investigation. As recently as November 2012, new information continues to surface. Namely, that within days of the assassination, the FBI visited both the jail and hospital in Eunice, Louisiana, and seized all records pertaining to Rose Sheremy. Those records have never been seen again. All right, Dr. Fesser, <clears throat> Rose Sheremy in my backyard here in Louisiana. Well, I think the Rose Sheremy story is completely authentic. I think uh, they showed this footage of her being dumped out of the automobile at least three different times here, but it's obviously reenactment, and they should have made it clear that that was reenactment because some naive viewers might presume that someone was actually there with a camera to film this car coming up this remote road and, and dumping her out, which of course is absurd. But the story she told is extremely significant, and of course the fact that the Dallas authorities were uninterested reflects the fact that they were profoundly involved in the assassination. In fact, it appears that uh, one of the members of the Sheriff's Department, uh, Deputy Sheriff Harry Weatherford, uh, uh, and a uh, uh, Dallas uh, the Police Department uh, officer by the name of Roscoe White were two of the shooters in Dealey Plaza who took out JFK. So it's hardly surprising that the Dallas authorities, who knew perfectly well what had actually transpired, would not want to be confronted with inconvenient information uh, from a source such as Rose Sheremy, and therefore that discounted it immediately, but that subsequently the FBI should gather up all the records uh, as late as 2000. 12, if I understood Len correctly, is really quite remarkable. It just shows they're not leaving any loose ends out there dangling. 
In this episode, we investigate the first-hand accounts of the assassination. Everyone alive at the time remembers exactly where they were when they first heard that President Kennedy had been shot. Colonel Fletcher Prouty, liaison officer between the Air Force and the CIA, was in Christchurch, New Zealand. Within seconds of reading the first paper he came across, photos of Dealey Plaza, reports of automatic weapons fire, he recognized that something was very wrong with the protection in Dallas. I was on my way back from Antarctica and I was in New Zealand at the time I heard about the president being shot. It was 7.30 in the morning, so I went outside looking around and finally out on the street I found a newspaper. This newspaper clearly tells the story. As we look down on this paper, in the lower left-hand corner, it says, The arrested man, not the killer, right. and not even the alleged killer, the arrested man lived in Russia. And from there on out, down through this page, and back into interior pages, is a whole story of Lee Harvey Oswald. By the time this paper was printed, the police had not charged Oswald with the crime which means that no reporter would have had a basis for researching files from all over the world, collating files and putting it all together, including a picture of Oswald in a business suit. Now, where did all that stuff get put together and prepared into a story that you could read on and on onto the back pages about Oswald when he hadn't even been charged with the murder? The Christchurch Star published this extra edition at around 1.30 p.m. local time, six hours after the assassination. Lee Oswald would not be charged with the JFK shooting for another seven hours. U.S. and international media began publishing Oswald's background and identity as a prime suspect within two hours of his arrest. To this date, the origin of the Oswald portrait photo has never been established, and there are several different versions in existence. This is a completely brilliant episode. Everything Fletcher Prouty says is telling and devastating and discerning. He was actually sent down to the South Pole on some ceremonial exercise by his superior, whom I believe may have been Edward Lansdale himself, who appears to have been responsible for orchestrating the actual shooting sequence in Dealey Plaza. I think this is uh, reflective of the great strength of Leto Sanic's long association with Fletcher Prouty. I think that uh, everything we hear here is completely devastating, and I've got to compliment Len on an exceptional episode number 10 featuring his mentor, uh, Fletcher Prouty, who was the liaison between the CIA, the Pentagon, and the White House for covert operations. He was a very knowledgeable guy and uh, an excellent resource, really, truly extraordinary.